Hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Michael McInnes. Maybe I won't do that because I'll hit my microphone. Um, for the last few years, I've been working on a new Unix shell called O. Uh, o has reached the point where it's complete enough and stable enough that I feel like it's time to tell other people about it. Um, I'm sure some of you are probably wondering why write a new Unix shell. Um, so O is an experiment. It's an experiment in um, improving the programming language features of the Unix shell while still retaining the fundamentals, fundamental characteristics of a Unix shell. So before I get to talking, though, about O, I wanted to talk about the way people talk about the Unix shell. So I found that people tend to say one or more of three things when they talk about the Unix shell. They say that it's beautiful, which is absolutely true. There's things that are possible to do with the Unix shell that, are, that feel almost impossible to do in other languages, right? So pipes and filters and things like that. The Unix shell is weird, right? Even the people closest to it describe it as a strange language. It has a very, um, the constraints are severe as a programming and command language. Um, and you can write your own. So people tend to say so one or more of those three things. It's, it's beautiful, it's weird, and you can write your own. And when they say you can write your own, it's often phrased like a taunt. Like, if you don't like it, go ahead. You know you can write your own. It has no special privileges. It's just a regular Unix program. And many people do. Um, so this is uh, a list of fairly distinct shells um, over the last 45, almost 50 years, starting with the original Thompson shell. Um, I haven't included things that are sort of workalikes, like the public domain corn shell or the Debian Omquist shell. So all of these are, are either continuations of their line or, or um, fairly distinct from each other. If we look at this set of shells, it breaks down into four, especially the, the, the successful shells in this, they, they break down into four main families. There's the Born shell, which is arguably the most popular of the Unix shells. The, the Born Again shell in particular is so popular that many people refer to the Unix shell as Bash and Bash as the Unix shell. There's the C shell and the TC shell, which I'm assuming is familiar to many people in this room. Um, there's the RC shell family, which uh, RC, was developed, RC shell was developed for Plan 9. Um, the ES shell is an open source re-implementation of the RC shell. And then if you continue that sort of lineage through in, in Plan 9 or uh, Inferno, which is what it became, then you have the Inferno shell. But at that point, we're sort of out of Unix territory. And then the last of the four groups, you have the fish shell, which is kind of a group unto itself. And as its name suggests, it's um, focused on improving the, the interactive aspects of the shell, making it more friendly. If you take those four families, those, those shells, um, they pretty much define what people expect when they say Unix shell. And Tom Duff, in his paper on the RC shell, has this great introduction where he says that the RC shell is similar in spirit but different in detail. Uh, from Born Shell, and he has a list of commands, and he says that the following commands behave as expected. And I think everyone would agree, those are the, that's what you expect when you talk about a Unix shell. You, you should be able to run a command, you should be able to run a command and pass an argument, redirect output, redirect input, globs, piping. Um, as you get further down in there, like the, the run a command based on the success of another command, there, the syntax may differ slightly between shells, like the fish shell, it's, it's, it's a slightly different syntax, but the, still the capability is there. So with, with all that agreement, with that strong agreement, why do people keep writing Unix shells? And I think the author of the scheme shell sums it up nicely. Um, the Unix shell is a command and a programming language, and it's a real programming language, but it's a terrible programming language. And I say that as a fan of the Unix shell. So I wanted to go over some of the actual problems with the Unix shell, um, and then I'll, and show which shells are affected by, the specific shells are affected by this. Um, none of these are horrible problems on their own. They, you can work around them. There are workarounds, or there's, you can turn off some of this behavior. But it's the combination that makes it, I think, that uh, people tend to avoid the shell, or at least in my experience, people tend to avoid it or, or not trust it. Um, so undefined variables not being an error. This affects all shells of, of that set of uh, successful Unix shells other than a C, C shell and TC shell. So I just have it shown declaring a variable, and then now you have a typo, so you declared a variable called var, and then you go to echo that variable, but you mess up the name and you call it val. Um, every shell except for the C, C shell and TC shell will just print nothing and <coughs> happily carry on. Um, C, C shell and TC shell will actually print an error, which is nice. 
all functions uh, accept a variable number of arguments. So I have a fairly useless function defined in the, the three syntaxes that we need that just takes uh, the first argument and prints it. But you can call this function with any number of arguments, and the rest of the arguments just get thrown away, and the first one gets printed. This isn't applicable to the uh, C shell uh, line because they don't have functions. There's word splitting, which I think anybody with a passing familiarity with the, um, the Unix shell has experienced. And this is a consequence of uh, shells not having lists. So lists get simulated with word splitting. So we, we reparse things and we treat them as lists in times when it's uh, convenient to, but sometimes it's inconvenient that that's happening. So in this case, if you set up this variable, then you might have the expectation that you're going to remove and this, this file name called important name with spaces, but that's not what's going to happen. It's actually going to remove important and name and width and spaces, or at least it's going to try to. Unaffected by this are RC, the ES shell, which is an open source implementation of the RC shell, as I mentioned, and then fish. So they've turned off that behavior. They don't do that, which is nice. Functions can only return 0 to 255. So um, there's an obvious reason for this. It's that so that functions act like processes, so they have the same return type. Um, but it means that if you want to return something other than 0 to 255, you have to go through uh, contortions to do that. A lot of times it involves either setting a global variable or you're printing the output and capturing the output. But then you'd better hope that your function doesn't call anything else that produces output, because that's going to get in the way. Um, the ES shell actually allows you to define uh, richer return types, um, and, but you have to use a special syntax to call them. So it's the one shell that's unaffected by that. But when you have a function like that in the ES shell that has a richer return type, those return types can't interact with features like um, conditional execution, where you have run one command, and then based on the if that one succeeded, run the next one. This is sort of a weird f feature of, uh, of most shells where variables are global by default. All variables exist in the same environment. And I believe that's because it's, it's uh, the processes environment is probably what they're doing. It's just viewed as one uh, bag where everything is in. So the, the weirdness here is that if you define these functions and you have uh, some variable bar and you set it, as soon as you've called that function, the variable bar now exists in the enclosing scope. Right? There actually is no sort of differentiation between those. And you can work around that. There's like uh, corn shell introduced typeset, so that, and then later that was called local by bash and zed shell. So you can declare local variables, but you do have to make sure that you do do that. And if you're sharing code with, like someone sharing code with you, if they forget to do that in a function that they've written, they can quite easily clobber your variables. and So it affects code reusability. There's very limited support for modularity. I'd almost call it no support for modularity. The only thing that you can do in a standard Unix shell is source a file, which means just take it and dump it into the current environment. So again, you have to worry about if things are going to conflict. And so it makes hard, it's hard to share uh, code, right? It's hard to write modules, shell modules, and share them with other people. There's no equivalent to like CPAN for, or a PIP or something like that for the shell. And then as a consequence of, of all these things, especially as a, as a consequence of those things making it, um, the previous problems making it harder to share code, there's this, I think, tendency to um, build in more and more features and use um, this increasingly tortured syntax to access those features for things that you might want to do. So um, maybe you want to grab the extension. So Z shell and bash include ways to do that. And we can kind of blame the born shell because it started this whole thing with variable expansions, which are a little bit strange. And then we just carry them further. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't know if I need to hammer um, home how weird some of these things get, like the fact that you would put this variable enclosed in curly braces and a comma after it would make it the first letter lowercase, right? And then two commas make the entire thing lowercase. It just seems increasingly strange. So with uh, those problems, there's a, uh, there have been a number of attempts to um, address those problems and to make a shell that's a better programming language. And all these shells listed are attempts to do that. But the problem with those shells, they typically have, they fall, they, there's one of two problems that they encounter. There's, um, they're either too cumbersome when used interactively, or, and the second problem is, a, is a, a consequence of trying to avoid the first problem. So when you, when you notice that it's too cumbersome and you sort of try to work around that, you can fall into the too complicated trap. So uh, just to motivate this, I'm going to show, this is the, the scheme shell. If you go to the scheme shell, scsh.net, and you go to about, 
there's this example, and they're talking about the scheme shell. And I believe this is meant to sell the scheme shell. It's meant to say, like, check this out. But I think anyone with a sort of passing familiarity with the Unix shell, when you look at, you know, this is what you'd write this fairly standard Unix uh, shell pipeline, and then this is what you'd write in the scheme shell, that's horrifying. That's not, it, it's not better. And, and I'm not really trying to make fun because I think the problem is that it's not really meant to appeal to people who have used the Unix shell. It's meant to appeal to people who, who are programming in scheme. So I think setting up pipelines and redirection and running things in the background are probably um, irritating to do in scheme, probably in the same way that they're irritating to do in C, where there's a non-trivial amount of code to write and there's some tricky details that you have to get right. And it's nice to have something like this where it just works. And so you can think of the scheme shell more as like um, a library, except it can't be implemented as a library because it has to sort of um, get to things before that. So it's, it's meant to appeal to scheme programmers saying, hey, if you're programming in scheme and you like what scheme can do, but you'd like to do shell-like stuff, check it out, now you can. And, and so just to, that I'm not making fun. So the, uh, Alan Shivers, the author of the scheme shell, um, actually goes out of his way to say that he, he acknowledges this, that yeah, it's, it's more cumbersome, absolutely. And he says he made no effort to hide the base scheme syntax. It's still meant to look like scheme. So but to me, sorry, for, for me, the, um, the problem with that is that you haven't made a better shell. You've made its scheme script would have been a better language because the shell is a, a command and programming language. So if you haven't made it at least competitive interactively, then you haven't made a shell. Um, now I am kind of making fun because this is a Ruby shell and, and its syntax I think is um, kind of particularly bad. But, uh, but again, like when you, when you, there's a way that you can get to that um, where you're coming from the point of view of that language and you're thinking, okay, you're thinking in terms of that language and you're thinking, okay, well, I'm in Ruby and I have dictionaries and maybe I could make the file system look like a dictionary. And so, cool, then I could find a file name in that dictionary, like home would be my home uh, directory. And then I would have a method called rename. And, and so you can kind of see how you would get to all those things. But if you compare that to what you would write in, in a Unix shell, it's really hard to see why you would want that. Right? Like there's no, I don't know, I would prefer that syntax. So people that write shells like this, like the author of FSH, which is different from FISH, which came much later. FSH was an earlier one. And, and FSH has the distinction in that list of being the one, um, the one shell that's not trying to embed the Unix shell in an existing language. So they actually invented a new functional language. And they had a more cumbersome interactive syntax. And so at one point, they, they admit that, okay, there's, yeah, there's no doubt that if you were um, executing simple commands, you'd probably prefer a regular Unix shell. But again, that's sort of the same as admitting that you haven't made a better shell. You've made a scripting language, but uh, you need to be useful interactively and as a programming language to be a shell. So when you notice that situation, if you're, if you're building a shell, there's a way to avoid it. You can make your language modal. So you can make it so that it sort of has two, it'll act like a shell sometimes, and it'll act like the you know, host language other times. So this is an, an excerpt from the uh, Perl Shells man page, I believe, and it's a, a section called the Standard Evaluation Strategies. So I just, the, all the details aren't important. I was just gonna call out a couple sections. It's gonna start at the bottom, where they basically describe that uh, there's this heuristic that they're going to apply to find out, is this a shell thing that we're doing, or is this a, a Perl subroutine that we're invoking? So, and they have this, the slogan is, if the command looks like an ordinary shell command, then we'd run it like one. So the problem with that is, okay, so now you have the system is, trying to, is gonna try and guess for you to, to try and be nice if this is a shell command or a Perl command. So then there's probably gonna be times that it guesses wrong. So you're gonna wanna override it. So they provide a mechanism to do that. If you start with a bang, then they say, okay, that goes, that's now a shell um, command. So send that all to system. If it starts with P bang, then okay, that's Perl, right? Uh, and then, I skipped through here, but uh, there's another one where if it starts with a brace, it's Perl. But then the next one that I'm showing here, which I want to call out because it talks about um, if the first word is a built-in, for, and there must be a way to define those in the Perl shell, then what it does, and this is what I find interesting, is that it receives a single argument, which is the remainder of the input line. So not only is, is it sort of modal and that it's choosing these things, but now the, the actual, the way that you interpret the line is different. So it's not splitting on spaces and performing very, like um, expansions and uh, the globbing and stuff like that, right? So you have the, it, it acts very differently. And so, the, like the author of the Python shell says, he updated his SourceForge uh, page later to say, uh, 
um, that he no longer believes that this approach is, is a good approach, right? You end up with a, an uglier and more confusing language because you basically inherit all the complexity of your host language, all the complexity of the shell, and then the complexity of the combination of the two. Okay, so I said I was going to talk about O, but I've gone on for about 30 slides talking about a bunch of other shells. Um, so to talk about O, I wanted to go back to a quote from the beginning, which is from the Unix programming environment, um, which I'm just going to read out. I hope nobody minds, which is, because it must satisfy both the interactive and programming aspects of command execution, it's a strange language shaped as much by history as by design. The funny thing about that statement, I think, is that there's a question in it. And the question is, does the Unix shell need to be so strange? How many of these, um, how much of this strangeness is historical and unnecessary? And, and before going any further, I wanted to assure you that O is a Unix shell. So I'm going to do the same thing that uh, Tom Duff does in his paper on RC shell. I'm going to say that it's similar in spirit, but different in detail. The following commands behave as expected. So you can do redirection, you can do globbing, you can do pipes. But I wanted to talk about five improvements that O makes as, um, to the shell as a programming language. Um, I've never met Yep Guy, but I assume he's a fantastic human being. Uh, so he says that he's keeping his eye on, on O because it adds some scheme goodness. And he's right, O actually steals a lot from scheme. If you, the, there are previous attempts, like there was a Lisp shell in the 80s, there's a scheme shell in kind of mid 90s. Uh, there's there's um, a lot of similarity between the two, especially like there's the prefix notation and sort of if you squint or, or look from far enough away, they look very similar. Um, so the design of O started with its syntax and the idea was to have something, um, have something scheme like that prefix notation was appealing. The earlier like Lisp shell, what they did is they dropped outer parentheses. They, they said, okay, well those can be implicit. And so you can get to something that looks very much like a a standard shell. And so it started with the syntax and it started with the idea that everything should be a list and those lists should be formed uh, out of con cells, which is a concept from, or, or a structure from Lisp or Scheme. So a con cell looks like this. I mean, it doesn't look like anything, but we draw them like that typically. And so you have like a two halves to this thing. You have a, a first and a rest or a head and a tail or a car and a cutter. There's a special con cell called nil where the tail points to itself and the head points to itself. And that's often written as the empty list. And so here's an example of a Lisp-like or a scheme-like uh, statement and how that might be translated in, or how that is translated into const cells, like what that looks like. So you have um, each, one, each section of that list is being pointed to by a const cell. The, each const cell points to uh, the const cell to its right. Um, the lists end by pointing to nil. So we, I started with that sort of syntax, but then it was, okay, let's make that look more shell-like. So one thing that I did was the same thing that the Lisp shell does is let's drop the, since we're going to be dealing with commands and we're not going to want to type those outer parentheses all the time, so let's drop those and let's just have those be implied. So we drop those. The next thing that we do is, so you can write that, that's like valid O. Um, the next thing we do is if the last thing, the last element of your list is a list, you can use a colon to introduce it. And that means that whatever follows is a list and it's the last thing in this list and that ends up being really useful and similarly if the last thing is a list or a, um, a set of lists then you can introduce them with curly braces so uh, but the the thing that you can do there is that you can have more than one list you could have a list and then have a, a sub list and another sub list and others and each one of those appears on another line and it kind of maps up with the way that you'd assume it would get parsed anyway so we start with that list scheme like syntax and then we have these three ways to write the same thing in O. Uh, those are all equivalent representations. It just gives us some flexibility to make things look the way that we would want them to look if you're uh, using a shell. The nice thing is or the neat thing is that those all get translated into lists. So all O deals with is lists and the interpreter just knows about lists. So it actually doesn't know about if statements or while loops or any of those things. It just deals with the lists that it's given and then it calls the right things to, to do what, like looking at the first element of that list. Um, so as a consequence of that, like the way that, you know, that colon can be used and it can be used to chain things, the else if looks different in O than it does in other languages like C or Java or whatever. And, but I'm going to claim that 
all scripting languages have weird else ifs, right? Python has elif, Perl has else if, PHP has else if, um, except for the C shell, which has else if, which looks like people expect, but forget that because it s screws up my story. <laughs> so else if looks like that in O. And it's a consequence of how you chain things together. Everything's a list. On top of that, the parser for O recognizes standard shell constructs, but it translates them into lists. So by the time it gets to the interpreter, the interpreter actually doesn't see those things. It just sees um, these uh, statements or commands. And those are actually implemented in O. A lot of O is actually implemented in O and then uses lower level. Um, Facilities. So one thing that I didn't talk about in the, and it's funny too, when they introduced Lisp, a lot of times they kind of skip this and then you encounter it later, which is, you know, they, they talk about everything's a list and it's all consoles and you just chain them together and, and everything's great. But then maybe you'll, you're wondering, but what happens when that last thing doesn't point to another console and it doesn't point to, uh, to nil? And so if it just points to something that's, well, it's called an atom, but uh, so something that's not a console and, and not nil, then you have what's called in scheme or in Lisp a dotted pair. And in O we write it like this. So we use the double colon. And that was done on purpose because that double colon is actually the cons operator in a lot of other uh, functional languages. And it's the namespace operator in uh, languages like C++ and um, PHP. Uh, and it's used for as both in O. So it's, it's actually, well, it's not a cons operator, it's cons literal, but that's how you express a cons cell, cons literal. And it's also used to, for member access. O has objects, which I'll, I'll get to later. Okay, so that was the first thing, same syntax for code and data. Um, another improvement is that O actually has a rich set of data types. So it's not just strings. Um, later shells added arrays, but it, they get kind of convoluted in how to use them. Um, so O has strings and symbols, or what you might call uh, bare words in a shell. It has lists, uh, it has a map, like a, an associative array or dict or, um, or map. It's, uh, it has sort of part of a numeric tower, and there's rationals, there's float, there's integers. There's bools, um, and then we get into, okay, there's uh, channels and, and then uh, continuations and then uh, abstraction things that I'll get to later. So I just wanted to pull out a, a few of these types just to show you. Um, so one of the problems with existing Unix shells is that when you define functions, they can only return zero to 255, and that is to, done to make functions look very similar to uh, process. They return the same thing and then you can use them in the same method, the same ways. So you could say, you know, run this and then double ampersand, you know, so if that works, then run this other command. So what O does instead to solve that is it defines a status type. And so the status type acts like an integer, except when you evaluate it in a Boolean context, in which case it acts the opposite to the way an integer would get converted, which is the same way that a Unix exit status gets uh, treated, which is that zero is success and any other number is failure which makes sense in a Unix shell because there's, or when you're running commands, because there's usually one way to succeed and many ways to fail. Uh, and so then I, it was just a goofy example of showing you that you could, you could use these as an integer or as, uh, as an exit status. So we run success, which always returns success, the status zero. And then if that works, then we echo adding one to failure. Failure is returning the status one, but then when it's interpreted as an integer, it, you, it's one, so you add one to that and you get the output two. I'm not saying it's a useful example, it's just small. Um, there's a map type. Again, the details of this aren't really um, that important, but what it is showing is that we can create this exit status map, and then we can use it. And so this is an example of getting the exit status from every uh, element in a pipeline, which is difficult to do in other shells. So we define this thing called a pipe fitting, because it's kind of a cute name. And you use this pipe fitting on every stage of your pipeline. So what you do is you say, I want to give it this name, and then I'm going to run this command with these arguments, and then what it does is it says, okay, run that command, and then take the exit status and shove it in the map with um, this name. And so at the end, you can pull that out. So you could get the exit status of every stage in the pipeline. Okay. Um, so I'm assuming, like, Jen Stahl, I've never met him either. I'm assuming that he's not a nice person. But, uh, but so what he says, he's, so, and I, I stumbled on this later. I wish I'd been, I'd been able to interject. So he says that the object system for O worries him and it looks like a tool optimized for building huge amounts of interlocking bullshit on top of the shell. I'm hoping to convince you that that's not true. Um, so O is a block structured language. It has environments. Those environments are hierarchical. I think they form a chain or a tree. Um, the one thing that O does is that it extends those environments to have public and private halves. So you can define a private name with define. You can define a public name with export. And then what O does is it actually exposes those environments as first class values. 
So the only additional work that we've done there in, in terms of the implementation is to make there be public and private halves. Um, and then we've exposed them as a value. There's something that you can get to. So here's an example. In, a, in O, if you have a block, the, the value of the block is the last command that was run. So in, in this case, the last command that we run is a command called context. What context does is it gives you back the current environment. And it gives you, it wraps it in a way, it, it's, an, it's an object, so, so that you can access public members but not private members. So in that block, we have an environment that's created for that block. It's like a child of the, the enclosing environment, enclosing scope. We define a public variable called x, we set it to 1, we have a private variable, private member called y, we set it to 2, and then we set O to be that environment that we created. So now if we go to try and uh, echo, if we echo um, $O, double colon x, so access x, that works because it's public, we can get to it. If we try to access the uh, private variable, we get an error. There's a nice syntax for that, so that you don't have to put context in it, it's just object. So you can say O is an object, and you can have it have a public member and a private member. And then again, it works as you'd expect. You can get to the, those are the same actually. There's just um, some syntactic sugar, I guess, added for it. So you can just say object. As an aside, um, variables like, so if you're just at this top level scope, it's the same thing that happens when you go to look up a, so if we did the same uh, thing that we did with other shells earlier, where we have a, a variable and then we you know, get a typo, we have a typo in the name, we try to print it, we're going to get an error in the same way. That thing is not visible, it's not found, it's not defined. So having these first class environments, exposing environments, uh, enable O's prototype based object system. There's no classes, um, there's just objects. So you define an object and then you use it. And then you can, if you want that to act like a class, you can clone it. And it's actually a really nice and very simple approach to objects that's used in other languages. Um, it's, there's minimal additions to the language, like the only thing that we really added was to make there be public and private halves to an environment, and then we just exposed the thing that we had. And what's neat about it is then there's a unified treatment of what are often different things in other languages. So modules, namespaces, objects, they all end up being the same thing, they're all objects. Um, so this is basically how a module works. It's a little more complicated, but it, you can think of it like this in O, so the idea being that it'd be nice if you could say, I want this object um, and I want the, the body of it to be this file. So then things that I've defined in that are gonna be, uh, that I've said defined to, which are private, are not gonna be visible. Things that I've exported are gonna be visible and I can access them through this reference that I have. And so you, you can get that, you, one, you could actually do that. You could say define M an object and then source a file, but you can also just say define M and it is import in this name. And so M now is your reference and you can get to public things in that module um, through that reference. And it's just an object, the same as other objects. Okay, so um, this is one of the neater things. Um, so Fexpers are um, something that were in early, many early, early Lisps. Um, they kind of got a bad reputation, uh, but it was mostly because of the dynamic scope that happened in early Lisps. Uh, so John Shutt wrote uh, his PhD thesis in, do I have the date? I think it was 2010. And he said, actually, you can have them in a lexically scoped language, and they're, they're perfectly fine, and, and they're, they're really nice, and they're really simple. And uh, so I stumbled across it, and actually, as I was looking for a macro system, because I always knew that I wanted one, but I hadn't figured out what I was going to do yet, and it fit really well. There's two requirements for you to use Fexpers, especially kernel-style Fexpers. So he wrote uh, in his thesis, he introduced kernel, his, which was uh, a scheme-like language, and it had Fexpers. And for kernel-style Fexpers, you need two things. You need the same syntax for code and data, and you need first-class environments, which we have, so we can use them. And so um, what kernel, these kernel style experts, what they do is they give us another form of abstraction. So we have three types of abstraction in O. There's built-ins, there's methods, and there's syntax. Um, this is meant to show you that when you define them, other than the name at the beginning, it's, they're all very similar. They can all take a self-parameter, which is basically where did you find this? It's the object that this was in or the environment that this was in. They take an argument list, and they, take, they can take an optional calling environment, which is where you came from. And the calling environment is very much from uh, Fexpers, from kernel. And that's so that you can, um, well, here, so I'll get to the next slide. So when, if you look at these, the difference between them is if you have a built-in, parameters get evaluated, symbols get expanded. It acts the way that a shell acts, right? So you have um, globbing and you have tilde expansion and stuff like that. If you define something as a method, 
you have parameters are still evaluated, but there's not automatic expansion of symbols. You can still do that. You can call glob on your own if you want, and you can expand them, but it's just not done automatically. When you define something as syntax, the parameters are passed to you unevaluated. And the neat thing there is because we use the same syntax for code and data, that means you can pass entire code blocks, and then you can do whatever you want with it. So it ends up that you can do all kinds of neat stuff with the language. That, so the other neat thing is that all of those can be built in to, on top of the last one. So you actually, the, the, you don't need built in as a primitive. You don't need method as a primitive. You can just have syntax. You can build method on top of syntax. You can build built in on top of method. They can work like that. They're not actually implemented like that, but you could. But it's just as simple the way that they're implemented. It's kind of a trade off. If you want to be a purist, you could just have syntax and then define it in terms of that. So um, this actually came up, uh, there's a conversation with a friend. Um, actually for the proposal for this talk. She was helping me fix it. And, uh, and as part of it, we, uh, as an aside, we were talking about she likes running uh, Exper from the command line to do quick calculations. But she gets annoyed because Exper is actually quite finicky in its parsing. And so if she forgets the space, like if uh, it doesn't have a space between stuff or something like that, it, um, it doesn't give her what she wants. So I was like, oh, you know, you could just, you could just define a function. You could just send stuff to BC instead. And BC is a lot nicer in its parsing. And so, um, and then I was like, and actually, if you were using O, you would write it like this. But then after I wrote that, I thought, well, that actually isn't really like, I'm not selling it there, right? Because it looks a lot more verbose. So that doesn't look like a, a good thing. So, but, oh, so, and then quick aside here. So a couple things that are happening there, just because it's kind of important. There's, um, I mentioned that other shells have, every, every function is variadic, uh, and there's word, uh, word splitting. O doesn't have those, but you can get that same behavior. So you'll notice that args has the colon before it. Um, so we could also write it like this. It's the last element in that list of arguments, right? So it's, you can put it all in parentheses, but you can also write it like that, which is just kind of nicer to write. It's the last element in the list of arguments, and it is a list. When the last argument in the list of arguments is a list, and this is kind of stolen from scheme, it means that this, argu this um, everything that's left over in the parameters that are passed gets accumulated in this, under this name. This name is a list and it gets everything. In this case, there's only one name, so every parameter that gets passed to this function shows up in this list. So you can have variadic methods when you want them. And then when you want to use that, if you want to expand it, so we want to write all of those out, then you can use the, it's a splice operator, it's the at. And so what that does, it's kind of similar to like star in Python, which just says, okay, like splice these in. So the, as if I had typed them all out, every element of this list. So you can get the, the behavior that you want from like uh, variadic functions and word splitting that, that other shells provide, but you, you can do it, you do it explicitly. So, but again, so back to this though. So, but that syntax, if we go back here, is it's a little bit verbose. And so, but by showing this, I want to show you, you can do something better if we're embarrassed by that. We can define a new syntax. So this is all O, and we can say, I'd like to define a function that works kind of like a born shell function in that it's going to take a magic parameter. I'm not going to say what it is. It's, you know, it's going to be, in this case, it's the underscore. But I don't have to declare it. All I'm going to say is I have a function. Here's the name. And then here's the block of code. And so um, that's what we do. We say, here's the syntax. And it's going to take a name and a body. And it's going to take an, uh, the calling environment, because it needs to go and evaluate those in the calling environment. And then with that, we can define something like this. So we can say, OK, this is how we now define this you know, uh, function in, in O. So this was a born shell function. This is now the O function. And we're pretty close. I think we're off by like a character in the, the top the declaration, and then one character when we actually go to send stuff to, uh, to BC. And at that point, I mean, if you're defining functions, you're, you don't have to be as competitive in terms of keystrokes, because you know, this is, a lot of this isn't done interactively, right? So just to show you that you, it's very um, malleable. So there's a couple shells in the list of shells that I didn't talk about. Um, I talked about kind of the successful shells and how they form the, the set of shells that we, that's what people think about when they talk about a Unix shell. And then there's other attempts to improve it as a programming language. There's also these other three, MTX, um, which was uh, interested in dynamic rearrangement of processes. And there's the push shell and the directed graph shell. And, and the thing that these all have in common is that they are, um, they're interested in expanding the notion of a pipeline. So either dynamic, um, changing dynamically the communication patterns, or uh, like in the directed graph shell, it's not a linear pipeline. You're going to have a like a directed graph, so you can have um, uh, just more complicated structure, right? Which you kind of get with uh, process substitution as well in, in shells like Bash and Z shell. 
So I wanted to show you that there's support for that. So you can do process substitution in O, but there's also you can do more fun things. So this is an example. It was adapted from uh, a paper called, uh, or a, a presentation on Newsweek, uh, which is a language for communicating with mice. So I showed this to some people and they said it'd be really nice. So I have some code and then I have some diagrams and they were asking me to flip the order. The original presentation shows it in this order as well, so I feel like kind of appeal to authority there that, that maybe that's the way to do it. But, but also, if I show it in the other order, then the code becomes really boring because you've already seen it. So I'll just go through this, but the point with this is that um, there's not a lot happening there. It's mostly about the communication, and, and it looks, I think, very shell-like in terms of what's happening. So you have a prime numbers channel. We're going to send prime numbers to this channel. We have a filter. Um, it's just a while loop. It reads from standard input. So it gets this number reads from standard input. It checks to see if it's divisible by the base that it's been given. If it's not, then it writes the number. So it stops things that are multiples of its base from going any further. It filters them. There's a connector channel that we create. And then we have this uh, counter. And so what it does is it starts at 2, which is the first prime number. Again, it's not really Im important that it's prime numbers. It's just that this keeps the, de the, the details of the computation, computation are very small. And you can focus. It's mostly on the, the communication that's happening. So we start at 2, and then we loop, and in that loop we write out 2, and then we add 1, and we write the next number, and we write the next number, and write the next number. And then we have the most complicated bit of this, which is the, the writer, and again, he sits there in a loop and uh, reads a prime number. He's originally connected to the counter, so he reads a prime, then he says, okay, I need to create a new channel, and then I'm going to spawn a filter for the prime number that I just read. So when he reads 2, he's going to now spawn a filter for uh, multiples of 2. He's going to insert this filter so it's listening to the connector. So the first time now, this is listening to um, the output of the counter. And he's going to output to this new channel. And then what we do as the writer is we put ourselves now at the other edge of the thing that we just created. And there's diagrams to follow. So, so this is what it looks like. So we have a counter, and it's connected to our writer. And it produces the number 2. And then we create this new channel, and we spawn a filter, and we connect it to the output of our counter. And then we put ourselves on the other side of this filter that we've just spawned. And then the counter produces three, and it goes through the filter. And we read it, and we spit it out. And then we create a new channel. And then we spawn a filter, and we put ourselves on the other side of that filter. And so we're rearranging uh, processes by um, creating these channels and changing the way that they're uh, communicating. And we can keep going with that. Um, so we create this filter for five, and then our counter produces six, but six is actually stopped by the filter two, right? So it doesn't go any further, and then seven is the one that follows through, and we spawn a filter for seven. Okay, so those are kind of the five, the same syntax for coding data and uh, first class environments, um, uh, kernel style fexpers, support for dynamic communication um, patterns, richer data types. So back to the original question does the Unix shell have to be so strange? I think there's some unavoidable strangeness um, with the Unix shell. There's um, bare words or um, where, so if we go back to the example of like moving a file, I'm moving this file from this name to this name, you would expect to type those without quotes. In any other language, you would put quotes around those because those are strings. They're not like, it's not a variable reference. The shell is the exact opposite. Things that you're typing are tend to be strings. That's just, this is just a string and I want you to treat it like that. I'll tell you when I want to do the opposite and that's the next bit there, which is that you have to uh, indicate when you want something to be evaluated. So you put a dollar before something. That means I want to evaluate this thing. There's the prefix notation, which is a little bit different from other languages. And there's attempts in other shells to avoid that, right, and, and say, OK, we'll, we'll allow you to have infix notation for certain things. But it gets really, um, I think it's easier just to say, just accept that strangeness. You get a less strange language by just saying, nope, that's how it is. You could probably imagine a world where that's not how it works. But I mean, we're 50 years in at this point almost. And I think that's the way that a Unix shell is going to look. There are characters that are special to a Unix shell that are not special in other languages. And then there's characters that aren't special to the Unix shell that are special in other languages. And that's just how it is. So I don't think you can really avoid those things. That's what a Unix shell is going to look like. I think the avoidable strangeness um, are all the things that are problems with it as a programming language. So all the things that we've gone through, undefined variables not being errors, word splitting, um, uh, limited support for modularity. And then, like I said, I think that the, um, the increasingly tortured syntax is a consequence of those things. Like not, ha not being able to share code means that you tend to want to cram more stuff into the shell and, and, sort of, and then you have to figure out a syntax to support that. And what I'm hoping that I've showed is that um, O syntax is actually very straightforward and, and um, 
very easy to understand. It's just structuring lists, basically. So, uh, and because it has support for modularity, there's a, there's a possibility of actually writing modules and sharing code, and so you don't have to build everything in. So I, I'm hoping I've also addressed that last point. Uh, for details, so O is written in Go, uh, so it's very difficult to compete on disk with the size of the executable. Go is statically linked, uh, whereas C is dynamically linked, so it's you know two to three times bigger on disk than uh, other shells. But when you load that into memory, it does better. Um, those those uh, ones that are written in C are dynamically linked, so they are loading in other things. So it looks about similar to on FreeBSD uh, Fish. So Fish is using uh, this is just me looking at top. Uh, so it was claiming 6.6 .6 megs on the system that I had of memory being used and always using 7.2. I'm not claiming that that's great. I'm just saying it's kind of within an order of kind of what's reasonable. It's sort of one to two times bigger than existing shells. Where it really shines is in the lines of code. So um, it's only about 8,000 lines of code plus about another 4,000 from non-standard library dependencies, whereas things like Bash and Zed Shell are well over 100,000, almost 200,000 lines of code. So in terms of code size, it's an order of magnitude smaller. Um, but it, it's, it's very competitive in terms of features. Uh, so if you go to my uh, GitHub repository, there's a link off the, the main, the readme, uh, which is comparing O to other shells, which I stole. There's a page called hyperpolyglot that does that. I just replaced the column that had corn shell with O. And so I left the bash, fish, TC shell, and Z shell things. So that's just a, it, an example of what that looks like. So if you, and it just shows you if you want to do this in one of these shells, here's how you would do it in O. If you want to install O, I don't have pre-built binaries. Maybe that's something I could look at doing. Um, but, so you need to install Go. Um, for FreeBSD, there are actually pre-built binaries of Go. For other BSDs, you actually need to install from source, but it's actually a fairly simple installation. And then once you have Go installed, you can say Go get, and then uh, my repo. And that's it. Any questions? Sure. Uh, yeah, the question is, this is all about programming, not about interacting with people. Rock about set the stage, comment the stage, awesome cup completion. Does this address any of those? So, okay, it has, uh, there is tab completion. Um, the tab completion is workable. It's, it's good enough for me. It, there's support to make it better. Like the, you could, there's functions, hooks for functions to be called and you know, to do more complicated things. What I'm hoping is that, so other shells tended to, tend to focus on the interactive features and so the programming language features continue to stagnate. So what I'm hoping to do is kind of restart and say, you know, it, it would be nice if other people were interested in this. Let's start here and you have a language that actually supports these things and now we can add these other interactive features rather than continuing to add those on top of something that is gonna fight you every time you try to write a script in it. Okay. So you say you, you focus on the programming part, like okay. the place where I work, it's basically forbidden to write shell scripts. We just go straight to Python, and I, as as a as a Linux user for like very many years, I might not be happy with that, to be honest. Yeah. So I think there's been there's a real prejudice against the the Unix shell, and I don't think it's entirely undeserved. Um, but I'm, I mean, I'm a fan of it. I don't, at work, I don't write O scripts. I write born shell scripts, right? And there's times where a pipeline is much simpler. Like, I, it really bothers me to see someone write something in Python that they should have written as a shell script, and right? There are, if it's bigger than like 20 lines, you just go with Python. And, like and I, yeah, and I think that, I, I don't know that I'm arguing necessarily for not having that uh, same rule. It's, it's just, it'd be nice to have something that isn't fighting you as much. And just to prove that you, it could be done. So that was kind of the idea was, the design space is huge. So I almost had to build it to prove that I was, I thought I was right. And so I wanted to make sure that it would still look like a shell. And you ha I had to go through the, the motions, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, this, this reminds me a bit of another uh, sort of new shell that I was reading on. Okay. Uh, the oil shell? So I've talked to the oil author uh, yeah, so because uh, this actually, this shell, uh, I did a master's thesis, which was, uh, I did a shell called Chalk, and it was written in C, and then I kept working on it, and I ported it to, to Go, because Go had all these features that I ended up, like, I, I needed, I was using threads, and I was using uh, the Bohmweiser Demers garbage collector, and I was, like, so there's so many, and I needed, you know, associative arrays, and so many of these things that, that were just built into the language, so 
Um, but he came across that and, and said that that was, he, was one of the things that got him excited about working on that. The thing that he's looking at doing is um, he's looking at sort of making it so there's this migration path so that you can just take a bash script and you can translate it into um, like an oil shell script. And he's got two things. He has OSH, which is his kind of just, you know, his, it works like bash, right? And then the plan is to have oil, which is going to have new features. But I don't know that oil exists yet. So it's coming. And I think it's, it's also, um, yeah, anyway, so he could probably say more. But yeah, it's, we've talked, and it's neat. It's neat to see other people like just, just playing in that, in that space, right, working on this. Because I don't know, it feels like there's, there hasn't been a lot of um, improvements for a long time. Say, go back to, I don't know, like Corn Shell 1983 is kind of like the last time. Because Bash and Zshell are very much open source implementations of that. And there haven't really been a lot of, Corn Shell is kind of an amazing like, uh, engineering feat to add the features that it did and stay backwards compatible. But it hasn't really moved much since then. Okay, so, yeah, so, and that falls into the problems that when people try to embed a shell in an existing language, right? There's like this, this mismatch, and so, I don't know, I, I feel like if nobody took anything away from me saying this, like if, you know, to tell everyone you know, don't embed a shell in an existing language. Like, just stop doing that because you're wasting your time, and, and you'll realize it later, and you'll be like, oh, yeah, that was really dumb. I shouldn't have wasted time on that. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, I mean, I have it currently at the, so if you look at the way it's implemented, um, there's a, a boot.o that is, a, so I said a lot of o is actually written in o, so it, at the end of sort of launching, it reads that, and that defines a bunch of other things, and at the end, that actually looks for a .org in your home directory, and then, you know, uh, reads through that. It could be whatever we want to call that. I mean, that's just, I was kind of copying what current shells did, right? But I mean, it's not that you're not going to be able to just take some other, like a dot file that was written for a born shell and use it. That's not going to work well. But yeah, the same facilities exist. And I think better facilities exist. Like you have, you can actually have modules, you can have data hiding and encapsulation and stuff that don't exist in other shells. Yep. I have one question. <coughs> That's, yeah, now for programming, what about such things as, okay, the, the idea that shell could understand the output of the programs maybe. So like if for example your common thread is JSON, could you mm -hmm. just get it directly fetched into your data structure in, in the shells? So I think you could map uh, map them into maps. So you could take a JSON thing and you could translate it into maps so they have lists and those kind of things. I haven't done that. Um, the other thing so I've seen other people that are that have made the suggestion Hey, it would be great if all of the shell, like the existing commands, produce JSON, and we'd consume JSON, and and yeah, and it would, and probably, but you have 50 years of history of things that don't do that, and and you can't go back and rewrite all those. So the idea with O is sort of a mechanism, not policy approach, like where the, it exists, you can pipe things together. That's like byte streams as a as a common denominator, but you can build things on top of that. One of the examples actually show is I have is because I use the same syntax for code and data, I can actually send code through a pipeline, and I can reconstruct it. So I send the code for an AND um, operator through a pipeline, evaluate it on the other side, and then use it. So it's kind of neat. But that's not using JSON. That's using O's syntax, right? But yeah, I think you could probably do a mapping to. I mean, JSON is like, it's the moment I look jealously at Microsoft Power Show users. OK. But uh, yeah, but there are other cases where like this output is kind of standardized. Yep. And instead of writing some stupid loops and grepping them, maybe the language could like at least understand some like like key equals value or something. Yeah. Like yeah. This. Well, and I mean, could be done directly in the shell. Yeah, and it's, with O, you can write modules, and you could actually share those modules. And it's not like the only option yeah. isn't to just source this file and then mm -hmm. hope that it doesn't conflict with anything that you already have defined. So there is the the possibility for code reuse, right? So you could actually write something that understands JSON and share it with other people and. Yeah. 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 
so it's actually, um, there's a couple of reasons. One is that I liked it because it was kind of one off from SH. It was like, so it's really similar, but really different at the same time. So that was part of the name, but it's also, I'm not that good at naming things, and it was an object-based, so the O, and it's a higher order, because you can have functions that, you know, so it was, my, the earlier shell it was based on was called chalk, and it was similarly not um, well named. It was a command, it was a concurrent higher order object command language, so yeah. But yeah, those are the sort of two reasons for that. If anybody has a better name, yeah, let me know. I'm kind of looking for a snappy name, but that's what it is for now. Yep. Any notion of dependencies? One of the tools, like people are talking about scripting and things like that. One of the things that I've gotten into just recently is using Mage. Yeah, I'm using Mage. Okay, I'm using Mage. Rags or Makes like utility. Okay. It just loads and compiles from Go, but it has a little bit of a framework there for scripting. Okay. The thing that's nice about that is it has dependencies, so I can build stuff in it and have you know dependency tracking. Okay. I think the short answer is probably no. I, like, I mean, but you could you could play with it and see what's there. I mean, you can do what you can do in other shells and hopefully a little bit more. It's a programming language. I'm, I'm hoping that it can support you. It, uh, the one thing that I kind of wish I'd done, I'd like to do, so I'd like to show that it's um, it's a shell, but it's also scheme. It's just scheme under, with an, another skin, but you could kind of see it as both things, so you have the power of those languages. That was kind of a nice way to bootstrap it, too, because you can sort of take lessons from that and apply them, but it's just the syntax is going to be different plus a little bit of extra stuff. Yeah. 